Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Do we have any questions before we begin tonight? I said in my uh, in my blurb this mor- this uh, afternoon to uh, send your que- to have questions or and your answers. Mm-hmm. So I know most of you guys don't read those. I don't have questions. I just have an aha. Aha! Uh-huh. What's what's the aha? Uh-huh? Well, well, you know how so many times we I've heard, heard preach that, that the law was the law that when Jesus came. came uh, his, his commands, commands to us, us went, went further, further or, 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 or more or harder to follow as believers. And, and I was specifically, it was, was the, the thought was about, about um, uh, murder, murder or, or anger. anger. And, and of course, of course, I don't I have, have it marked mark the way I should, I should have marked it. it. But, but it, it says, point blank. blank. Um, in, in Leviticus, Leviticus 19, 19, verse 17, you, you shall, shall not hate your brother, brother in your heart. heart. And, and that, that immediately made me think of Matthew 5, 5 21, 21 and 22, 22 where, where, and I'm going, that, what, what pastors, pastors have taught is so. so. The, 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 what they what said was harder or new in the New Testament, Testament it was already, already here. here. Right. Um, right, right, right before that, it says you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. And that's in James 2.19. So what, what I was so often told, it's right there in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. In the law. Yeah, the, so that was the, uh, the, uh, the, the problem with, with the church's understanding of the law, and we're going to cover this in one of the questions tonight, but the problem with the church's understanding of the law is they didn't understand what the law did. The law was not necessarily just the law. It was the principle behind the law, which is what Jesus taught in the Beatitudes. And, uh, and you know... Um, if, if you think anger in your heart of a person, is is that murder? No, it's the same thing as murder, according to Jesus. It's not murder, because the guy's not dead. But it's the same mm-hmm. thing. And, and so that's the principle behind the law. And so the church has missed the boat, because they haven't taught the principle of what the law is talking about. And then we have this goofy teaching that the law is abrogated by Jesus coming, and now we live under grace. That also is not true. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Any but other anyway, questions? I, 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 that was that just a light bulb. I went, went it's, it's right, right there. there. That's why we teach the whole Bible. Well, I've well, read, read Leviticus umpteen times, times, but, but that, that, one that one just never, just never struck, struck out before. before. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then let's go to our first question that I have for you, then. Um, What happened here? Why can't I see what I need to see? There we go. According to Leviticus 16, 29 through 31, what does God command the people to do while the priests are atoning for their sins? Here's, Here's the passage. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you for on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you you shall be clean before the lord from all your sins it is a sabbath of solemn rest to you and you shall afflict yourselves it is a statute forever so what's I God telling them? Up. I'm sorry? I looked, I looked that, that word up. up. And which which it, word? It, it, afflict. Okay. And, and it goes, goes the gamut, gamut from, from causing, causing yourself, yourself physical, physical harm, harm to, to humble, humble yourself, yourself and submit yourself, yourself to God. God. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is what is the intent of what God is doing here? Not just the afflict part, but the whole the whole package. What's He telling them to do on the Day of Atonement? It's a special Sabbath day. That's part of the formula. And then He says to afflict themselves. What's He mean by that? I think yourselves, yourselves says to my Bible. Bible. I think it means that they should be standing in front of the, the, the tabernacle, tabernacle and, that and that they should be focused on God and, and, and talking to him about how, how they know they, they have sinned. sinned. It should, it should be a God, God focus, focus and not, 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 not thinking, thinking about, about something, something else. else. That's the Sabbath portion, right? The afflict portion, most uh, scholars uh, understand uh, afflict to mean fasting um, or depriving yourselves. And some scholars go as far as to say the deprivation includes food, drink, sex, shoes, bathing, anything that would make you feel better. So it is, a, it is an absence of any pleasure and it is a return to focus entirely on God. What's that sound like it should be? I mean, what's it sound like the intent of that is? If you're, if you're to be on a Sabbath and deprive yourself of things that make you feel good. The world. <laughs> the world, no. It sounds, it sounds like, like Lent. Lent. <laughs> and? Doing, Doing penance, penance for, for your, your sin. sin? Well, that's, that, that certainly is where, where Catholics get the, one of the places Catholics get the idea of, of penance and, and the old um, ecclesiastical orders that would flagellate, flag, flagellate, flagellate, I was missing a syllable, beat themselves, yeah, and that's, that's where that comes from, but what is the intent of not being inward focused, but Sabbath being Upward focus. Yeah. To God. Focus, focus God. To focus, focus them on God, God instead of themselves. Yeah. Think about this being the day of atonement. When when the, the priest goes in first to atone for himself and then atone for the people. When they have this sense of salvation coming to them from God. And they are to be in a worship state of God. You know, unfortunately, Sabbath has been kind of misunderstood, and and we'll talk about the Sabbath more in in a little in a little while. Uh, but in this case, it's a specific extra Sabbath day, so that they're thinking about what God is doing. It's not so they hurt themselves or deprive themselves. It's so that it's not inward focused. It's outward focused. It's God focused. So when we're thinking about God's salvation for us, we should be thinking about Him. It's not about you and getting salvation. It's about Him giving salvation. As I've said repeatedly lately, God has really been hammering me about, about His sovereignty. And every morning as I'm sitting out on the patio and reading and, and uh, praying, I'm trying to focus on him and think about what his sovereignty means to me and how that's important. And like I've said, I try not to ask for anything in this time. I'm trying not to to be inward focused. I'm trying to be only God focused. And it's it's remarkable how it changes my perspective of where we're at in the world. And that's what God wanted them to do at least once a year. Now, we'll talk about uh, weekly, yearly, and our weekly seven-year Sabbath and 50-year Sabbath. We'll talk about that in a little while. But there, Sabbath was a special thing God had created. Remember, he created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh as a demonstration of what Sabbath is to be. It's not just a day of rest. It's a day of focus on him and not on us. Mm-hmm. We, we work for ourselves six days, you know, everything's focused on, on what we want, and at least on one day we need to be focused on Him.
Any other questions or, or comments on on uh, this Day of Atonement Sabbath special? Okay, question number two. In Leviticus 17.7, God calls the false gods the Hebrews worshipped goat demons. What conclusion should we draw from this statement from God? Here's, here's uh, Leviticus 17.7. So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. So what's a goat I, demon? Go ahead. Goat demon was, was a goat demon a deity that the Egyptians worshipped? That's correct. The, the, uh, the, the god Ram was a goat demon. Mm -hmm. It was the primary senior god, if you will, in the northern area of Egypt where the capital was at the time of the Exodus. And uh, it was what they would have known because that's the region they were in. It's the primary god they would have known. So what conclusion should we draw from this statement? That they were to know more um, here's the verse again. They shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout the, their generation. What's the principle? What's he telling the were, Hebrews? That they, that they, they were, were still, still doing, doing it. it. And that they should... I, I, I make comments to myself, myself in the Bible here. here. That, that, that they, they were, were still... still Wanting, wanting to do it, or we're still, still doing, doing it. it. And the and reason, reason that God, God said all the sacrifices, sacrifices had to be made at the tabernacle or later the temple was so that they couldn't or shouldn't be tempted to do them in the field where they could still worship other gods, but had to do it at the tabernacle or the temple where they were forced to focus on yelling. That, that is an observation, but what's the principle that lasts for us today? Don't worship all previous gods or idols. Okay, build that out some more. Don't worship the previous gods. What do, what else does that mean? You're you're on the right track. It means there's a transformation at salvation. Mm -hmm. We 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 talk about repentance. What does repentance mean? It means turn and go in God's direction. Yeah, go in God's direction. And what he's saying here, you Egyptians, you didn't turn around. You're still doing what you used to do. Stop that. Don't ever do that again. Turn and follow me. Go in my direction. That's the only way you can go is my direction. And so the you principle can for take us... You can't take the Jews out of Egypt. You can't take the Egypt out of the Jews. Right. <laughs> The principle for us is we've got to stop being what we used to be. We've got to stop doing what we used to do. I don't know how many Christians look at their horoscope every day. I just want to beat the dog snout out of really? the person that does that. I just want to go up to them and, and pummel them. That's weird. I know of churches that put zodiac signs in their bulletin. Let's be real here. God said, don't do that stuff anymore. But that's not the way the world thinks. And so it is, it is a real problem. We need to stop doing what we used to do. There needs to be a transformation. We, we need to be different than we were. That is the mark of salvation. And God has been saying that for a long, long time. The, Jew, the Hebrews were to completely separate themselves from everything that had been. I don't think there's any indication that the Hebrews worshipped Jehovah in Egypt. They only get really introduced to Jehovah on the Exodus. And certainly Moses didn't know who he was. But he knew who all these other gods were. 
And Aaron didn't know who he was, but he knew all who the, all these other gods were. And so God takes them out to the wilderness to be a big, big dividing line in their past life and their new life. And they were failing the test over and over and over again. And so he tells them, don't do that anymore. And in this passage and in the one we saw in the previous question, where, where it's talking about... Uh, um, the atonement, what they're supposed to do on the Day of Atonement. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. What does that mean? They still still should be doing doing it. it. Right. For the Jews, even Jewish Christians, I think, these practices still need to be obeyed. The principle applies to us as well, but here these are specific statutes for the Jews to obey. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. Jesus didn't abrogate these laws when he came and died on the cross. Jews were still obligated to do that, and I think Jews are still obligated today, except they don't have a temple, which is a whole other set of issues. Right, so practically speaking, how how would they? they? Well, in, in the case of this passage, so they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons, that's pretty easy. Separate yourself from what the world says, and that has to be forever. And as soon as I give you a place to, to have a sacrifice again, you better get your uh, lambs there and sacrifice. Has it just dawned on me, thinking about Egypt, the old world empires all had not multiple gods to... More than multiple gods. Right. For the Egyptians, all of them. Right. Each and every one of them. That yeah. for everything a god. Right. And that, that's why Isaiah said, you know, how much sense does it make to take a log and cut it in half, and half of it you put in a fire and you warm yourself, and the other half you bow down and worship? How much sense does that make? But that's what they were doing. How much sense did it make for Aaron to make the golden calf after they'd been through the the uh, the the Red Sea? They it right. made sense to them because that's what they knew. They didn't know the new stuff yet, and so they were just falling back in their old ways. How many times have we seen somebody claim to come to Christ and then something happens and they fall back in their own ways? That's exactly the same thing that Israel did. And so God gave them specific laws saying, you can't do that anymore. It takes takes growth growth and maturity maturity in in Christ Christ to to come come out out of your your old old ways. ways. Case in point, point, Jane Jane Milo. Milo. Mm -hmm. She still went went to the horse horse train and betting when I heard when she was was a first Christian. We all hold on to some old habits for a while, and maybe maybe some some longer than others, others, you know, know, but it it takes takes growth and maturity in Christ to 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 make make those changes. changes. Which is different than the popular teaching of the 60s and 70s, is that you got to get rid of all that so that you're savable. You're only savable when when you've got short hair, long dresses, and so forth. Right, right. But you got to do that before you're saving. Right. And, and the popular, popular teaching, teaching that, that says, says that, that once, once you're saved, saved all that stuff, stuff is gone, and, and it is you're, you're sanctified, sanctified and, and you're, 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 you have, have no more sin. sin. Yeah, that's, that, that's an absolute it, false teaching, a heresy, because we all know we still sin. Look at Peter. He he resided with with Jesus. He was one of the inner circle, and he still sinned Good. multiple times in Jesus' presence. Right. 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 But that, 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 is, uh, that is going, going around. around. Oh, yeah. I have I encountered, encountered it here in the circle several, several times. times. When, will we be, when will we be fully sanctified? When we, we get, get to heaven. heaven. Yeah, when we're glorified. Not until. Right. We, we're supposed to be in the sanctification process. We're supposed to be getting more and more Christ-like. But none of us get there. Until we get there. How was that for a turn of phrase? Yeah. 
I don't I think, think we'll be glorified until we face the beam of Satan. So. Huh. That, that's all sorts of theological conundrums. Well, the, 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 the conundrum is, is that, that we're not absolutely sure when the Bema takes place. Is it only at one specific time, or is it when every believer goes to heaven? Because I can't find anything in the Bible that says when Bema comes. Okay, that's a new, uh, a new re research topic. <laughs> because I can't imagine being in heaven, and then, and then all, all of a sudden, sudden after, after all, all that, that time, time, or no time, time turning, turning around, around and having to face my sins, sins and shed, shed tears, tears and God wipe them away. That's well, you don't have to, to face your sins. Your sins are dealt with. You don't have to face them. They're dealt with. You never face your sins again. All, the only judgment you will face, provided you're a Christian, is that what Thanks. you've done for what you've done for Christ, and the opportunities you've missed, and the rewards that you receive then are are present are given to you to present to Jesus. But you don't have to face the issue of your sins. That's done with. Well, right. right. I'm, I'm I should, I should have said, have said works. works but, but, yeah, works well. is much better. So when when we get to heaven, we no longer will be sinning. True. Sure, sure. Which means we've been sanctified. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other any other questions on this? Okay, we're moving right along tonight. Here's question number three. Okay. What principle is given in Leviticus 19, 9 and 10? Here's the passage. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So what's the principle, and what implications does it have for us today? Go. The principle is to take care of the poor. That's, that's only part of what is being said there. If you are... If you are not reaping to the edge of your land and you are not picking up all that your harvest has, a modern day capitalist would say you're not doing it right. True, True but in that, that time, time it was meaning allowing for gleaning. Well, that's the purpose of it, yeah. But what's the other principle here? It's all it's God's, God's, and you do with it what He directs you to do with it. Okay, that's good. The principle is you trust God. You don't have to get the very last dime from somebody. You don't have to upsell them 14 bags of dog food for two dogs that only eat a bag a month. Sorry, Chuck. <laughs> God cares about the poor. <laughs> Correct. Cares God cares about, about the poor, but that's only half of the principle. Because the other half is the part where you don't have to go get everything yourself. See, the capitalist mind today, and I'm a capitalist, okay? Understand, I'm not speaking ill of the capitalist mind, but the capitalist mind today is, I've got to get every dime, I've got to squeeze every dime I can out of this operation. That means I pay my workers the very least I can get away with. That means I give them the very least of equipment. I give them the very least that I can get away with. That's the capitalist mindset. And that is not what God has ordained as the right way to go. Here he's telling them, listen, leave some in the fields. You don't have to get it. I'll take care of you. You don't have to get it all. Leave some. So that others can come in, the poor, the indigent, can come in and get it. 
It's not the responsibility of the government to take care of people. It's the responsibility of people to take care of people. But we have made it such they can't do it on their own. I'm sorry, go ahead, Linda. But notice they leave it in the field. There's still some responsibility for the poor too that it's not handed to them. That's right. They have to go get it. They have to go get it. It is not handed to them. They have to work for it. There is no check at the end of the month without having to go work. See, the principle is two-sided here. We always look at this that God cares about the poor. But God is also telling the, the, the people that are making money, you don't have to make every dime on this operation. You need to leave some. Imagine how a business, how employees in a business would flourish if the, if the business didn't demand the lowest pay possible the least amount of of equipment, but actually took care of the people, provided them good wages, higher than what others were were doing, provided them with good facilities and good good equipment and good care and good time off. People want to work for those kind of places and only work for the other kind of places when they can't find anything else. I think that's what what we're we're seeing seeing now now is... is with, with the, the increase, increase in the, in the um, minimum, minimum wage, wage, the companies, the companies that, that can't, can't afford it, they don't, they don't have the workers. workers. Hobby Lobby's paying $18, $18 an hour. An hour. They're, 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 they're getting the workers. workers. Even, Even if that's, that's not, not what, what you, you went, went to school, school for or, or that's, that's what your dream job, job is, is, it's paying, paying the bills. bills. Yeah. And everybody, everybody else, else is having a hard time. Me and Chuck were years and years and years ago. That, that to provide good customer, customer service, service to your customers, customers you, you have to take, take care of your right. customers, which are your employees. employees. Everybody right. is a customer. Right. Take, take care, care of it down the line. line. And, and but the, the mom, mom and pops, pops understand, understand that. that corporate, corporate America does America not because no, corporate because America because squeezes be, the terms. Right. They they have to get ev- up to the edge of their land, and they have to pick up every grape. They can't leave mm-hmm. anything because that's losing money. Yep, yep. They have to give to their shareholders, not to their employees. Right. right. So the, to the some pre- extent, but if you don't have a good work staff and you don't treat them right, you're gonna you're gonna lose in the long run. Right. You know, I don't see it in every organization. No, it's yeah. not. It's not in everyone. But the the, I don't. the the capitalist mind is is really fixed on squeezing the last dime out of everything they can, and that's really not good. That. That's really not good. It's it's even the same. You know, I, I worked in government for thirty years, and it's even the same in government. You know, the first sheriff I worked for. I, I didn't experience that. The the first sheriff I worked for, you know, we drove cars for two hundred fifty thousand miles, and and he was he was more concerned about getting us good pay than he was good equipment. And as soon as we started well, getting good equipment, they're maintaining their 250 miles, thousand miles is nothing. If they're not maintained, then you have a problem. It no. was in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, it sure was. Yeah, you got the 100,000 in a car in the 80s. And That's true. That's true. That's true. But not yeah. today. But no. you know, still a good maintenance. So, so the principle here is, is don't try to squeeze every dime. Do what's I'm best for be. your people, and do do something that allows for the poor. Um, years ago, I, mm-hmm. I worked with the with the guy that started Lisar. Lisar is the organization mm-hmm. that is owned by Lee, Lee Health and Sarasota Health and a couple other hospitals that provides all of their material for them. the The guy that the director of Lisar, he and I got to be friends, and and Bob told me he said, "Here's the deal." If people want to want to be a, uh, to sell to us, they're going to have to invest in our community. They're going to have to do charitable stuff in our community, and it can't add to the price that we pay for the material. And that was a good deal. That was good for Lee County. That was good for Sarasota County, because you know they, Bob would say sell uh, or buy um, five million dollars worth of hospital beds. And they would have to give a certain amount to the to Lee County and Sarasota County, uh, and he did that all the time. That's taking care of the community 
as well, not just looking at the bottom line. That's the other side of this principle. Of course God takes care of the poor. But there's some responsibility for the poor in us as well. And he practiced that himself as well. Wasn't, uh, wasn't he the one that gave the defibrillator? That's correct. Yeah, I, I contacted Bob and it said, hey, I'd like to buy a defibrillator for our church. Can you hook me up with a with a retailer? And he took me over to the uh, to the vice president of Lisar that handles all their electronics, and he says, make sure he gets the defibrillator he wants. So there was a there was a three or four thousand dollar defibrillator to the Friendship Grace Brethren Church for nothing. And so that he was practicing what yep. he was. Yeah. Expect of his, his uh, vendors. His yep. vendor. Yeah, he was a good guy. He is a good guy. I think he's still alive. Okay, any other questions on, on this topic? We we miss this all the time. We always look at the poor factor on this and we we don't see the other factor, the other side of the principle here. Okay. Uh so what time we got? Forty six. Okay. Here's question number four. God gave the command to keep the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments. He then instituted the Sabbath year every seventh year, and then the year of Jubilee every fiftieth year. What's the principle, and are we obligated to keep the Sabbath? We're not seven-day Advent, seven Adventists, so uh, I'll just... Leave it at that. I would think that yes, we're we're not seven day Adventists. I know I said that wrong. Well, you actually but, said pretty good. Um, but God still has the principle that we cannot work ourselves into the ground. There's a reason why we need to spend time with God, spend time with our family, spend time with each other. But is that the entirety of the Sabbath principle? entirety of it is we don't own what we're given we're just borrowing it okay it's, it's like it's like a mortgage but there's no end term for it okay that's good. everything everything we've been given here i mean we're, we're just kind of a placeholder okay that's good but not complete yet what what is truly the sabbath principle Worship God. Okay, mm -hmm. worship God. We talked about this a little bit ago. What were they to do on the on the Sabbath day of atonement? Focus on Him. Yeah, afflict mm -hmm. themselves. Not focus on themselves. Focus on Him. So now think about the think about the Sabbath that Israel was commanded to keep. Every seventh day was a Sabbath. Every seventh year was a Sabbath. So seven times seven is 49. So the 49th year is a Sabbath. And the 50th year is a Sabbath. So what were they supposed to do on the seventh, 49th, and 50th year? They had to work. Trust you know, God. Yeah. yeah. They had to trust God that he was going to give them enough abundance in the years before the Sabbath year or the year of Jubilee. To last, to last them, them through, through that, that year, year through, through the year, year of the following year, year for the planting, planting and, and harvest, harvest to, to, so, so that they would have food, food the third year. year. So what's the Sabbath the, principle? Trust, trust faith. faith. The God yeah. supplies. Yes, and more. Dependence. Okay. okay. They were totally dependent on God. Even on the Sabbath day. You know, they were very limited what they could do. You go to Israel today, Friday after Friday evening, you can't get on an elevator that doesn't stop on every floor. And because they didn't have those pads on the floor for their phones either. either. What? They, they, they have, have pads, pads on, on the floor that are attached, attached to their, their phones, phones so that they don't, they don't have, have to pick up the phone, phone and, and, <laughs> when they need to answer, answer the phone. phone. Oh. I'm sorry, when I was in Israel, we didn't have phones yet, but, you know, you, you, 
pushing a button on an elevator or picking up your phone apparently is work. That's, that's a perversion of Sabbath. But the Sabbath principle is more than just rest. It is a focus on God, and not a focus on yourself, a focus on God, and a dependence on Him. You know, you can get by on a day if you, uh, if you didn't have enough food on, uh, on the day before, you, you, you would be okay. But you're not getting by a whole year. And then imagine when it's year 49, which is a seventh year, uh, and then year 50, which is a Sabbath year. So in year 48, hopefully you had a really good harvest and you kept some of it because you're going to have to live off of that for, for year 49 and 50 and for the first half of 51. So it requires a dependence on God. But wasn't the 50th year also the return of property and land? Oh yeah. Yes. The year of Jubilee was a big deal. Um, when you sold a piece of property, you, you priced it according to how many years until the Jubilee. Or you were supposed to. Just as they did do that. Right. If you go back and you read the uh, the book of Jubilees, which is a uh, book from from the intertestamental period that details Israel's history from the vantage point of the Jubilees, Israel wasn't good at keeping the year of Jubilee. They weren't good at keeping the Sabbath year either, but they were told to. And the principle is still the same. That's one of the reasons why they went into captivity. That's correct. That is right. The, the specific timing of the captivity was to make atonement for the years that they didn't have Sabbath. Yep. yep. Very good, Sybil. So, back to the question. Are we obligated to keep the Sabbath today understanding the principle? Not a specific day, but the principle. Well, we are obligated to have a total dependence on God, period. And a, a God focus and not a not an us focus? Yes. yes. Everybody agree? Okay, then. I don't know. You don't know? You don't know? I'm, not, I'm not sure as a believer anyone would agree that that's a Sabbath principle, but that certainly is a principle from basic on our salvation. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's why I asked what the Sabbath principle is, and are we still bound to live by the Sabbath principle? See, laws may have been ab abrogated, but principles haven't been. Mm hmm. Okay, here's your, your final question of the evening. Maybe. What are the three ba basic types of law presented in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, the Torah? Which ones are, are we bound to obey today? The devil? Ceremonial? Civil, ceremonial. And... Whatever you call, I was going to say, whatever you call the church or peace ones. The church ones? What? They're 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 okay. Are they? Here, here we go. moral laws. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Anne. Here we go. And here's they're the a good, ones we have to keep today. today unless we're Jewish. Here, here's a good list of, uh, of ways to, to view them. Declarative or civil law. Levitical, criminal, penal, judicial law. And they are not as you understand those words. I have to explain these, and I will. And the third category is Deuteronomic. Oh, I forgot my three. Deuteronomic or constitutional law. Okay, let's uh, look at these again. The uh, declarative or civil law. This type of law aims to aid Israel to understand how to live together as a united people in harmony, safety, and and purity. This law is seen in Exodus chapters 20 through 24, which includes 
the first giving of the Ten Commandments in, in Numbers chapters 5 and 6, chapter 15 and 28 through 30. Whoa! Whoa. I can't write that fast. What's the last, the last part, part one in numbers? numbers? Numbers 5 and 6, 15 and 28 through 30. Thank you. The civil code should help help the church understand what God the Father considers important. So you you go through the you go through the Ten Commandments, which are only a portion of them, and there are there are commandments that they call horizontal, and there are commandments that they call vertical. That commandments that deal with our relationship with other people, and commandments that deal with our relationship with God. He considers things that he talks about in the commandments and in the laws important. And so we get a we get an indication of what he's all about. This the oops, wrong one. The second set of laws, Levitical, criminal, penal, or judicial law, when when you put that in a list, people say, Oh, that, those are the ones that we would have to follow today. These are actually not the ones we have to follow today. Because remember, for Israel, they were in a theocracy. That means God was the head of state. He was the king. And these are violations of God's character. Essentially, these are sins that we still commit today. That we, are still, uh, that we still violate. These uh, deal with a violation of God's lawful authority. It's criminal only in the theocratic sense. In other words, it's not a crime for us today, necessarily. Some things that are involved in this may be a crime, but it's not a, a, a crime necessarily. It is, a, it is an affront to God himself, which in a theocracy would be a criminal action. The law provides God's principles of atonement and redemption. Then the third category is Deuteronomic or constitutional law. This law defines how a Jew should live in a truly obedient Jewish society. When you get in the land, these are laws for you in perpetuity. Like we read twice already tonight. Things that God said to them, these are things you got to do. He didn't say that to me about those things. He said that to the Jews. And that's what those Deuteronomic or constitutional laws are. And I'd point out, and we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but we're not going to. I would point out that Deuteronomic or constitutional law is organized in, in a manner that's consistent with how suzerainty treaties of the day were fashioned. How a suzerainty treaty is a treaty of a of a larger being or a larger entity caring for a smaller or minor entity. So in the in this in the place of God, he's the larger entity and he's caring for us and we've entered into a treaty with him or he's entered into a treaty with us, where he says, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to take care of those things that you need. You have to do these things. That's, okay, you can stop doing that now. That's uh, what the uh, um, constitutional or Deuteronomic law is. Any questions or comments? Uh, let's answer the question that I asked first. Which of these laws are we bound to today? The first, the first one. one. The declarative laws, yes. I should also point yeah. out that in the second or in third, Deuteronomic or Constitutional, is the second giving of the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments actually fit in both categories. Yes, yeah, certainly the first one, right? Yeah. yeah. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much laws that are still applicable to, to us today. I was reading, studying this afternoon, and Greg Kokel had a, had a great explanation of why some things apply to, to Israel and don't apply to us. He, he used the illustration of 
living in Ohio, he's not bound by California law. There are some things that are illegal in California that are not illegal in Ohio. It's more likely the other way around, though, that there are things that are not illegal in California that are illegal in Ohio. And so we're bound by, by where we are. And as a dispensationalist, we're bound by what we're bound by in, in the church age and not in Israel, in the Levant, 2,500 years ago, 20, 2,000 years ago. So they're, 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 some of the principles are the same. Like he, in his illustration, Kokel said, well, in California, there's a law against murder, but there's also one in Ohio. So I'm not bound by California's murder law, but I am bound by Ohio's murder law. So there are some things that we're bound by that are the same, but it's not that law. So understand the, the difference of that. We could spend weeks talking about the law and the differences of them. But it's been a popular teaching in the church for years that Jesus came and abrogated all the law. The law does not apply to you and me anymore. As a guy that enforced the law for 30 years, I can tell you that's not true. Because I've put people in jail for stealing, I've put people in jail for murdering, I've put people in jail for, for all sorts of stuff. There's still laws against that. Wow, everybody's so quiet now. <laughs> Feasts. Feasts. Feasts in it. Seven feasts that would be the Deuteronomic or, or constitutional law. Well, that's, that's the one, one that, that, that the Jews, Jews absolutely should be keeping in camp. camp. Right. Yeah, for, for a Jew today, it's a real frustration that they have no ability to keep some of the laws they're told to keep in perpetuity. And I've never, ha I've asked plenty of Jews but never had one satisfactorily answer the question, what do they do then? Because they don't want to answer it the way they have to answer it, and that is they have to have faith that God will save them. They don't want to answer that way, because that's not the way they were trained. See, that's getting way too close to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so every, every non-Christian Jew that I've asked that question to, they shy away from saying what they know to be true, is I have to depend on God to save me. Any questions or comments? Wowzer, everybody's so quiet now. <laughs> Our brains, Our brains are broken. Are good. <laughs> Some, something, something that, that I, found I found interesting. interesting. I, listened I listened to Randy's, Randy's uh, one, one, one hour introduction uh. to number. I did, I did not, not realize, realize that the Jews spent, spent one, one year, year on, on Sinai. Sinai. That, that was a surprise. surprise. Yep. Carolyn mentioned that this morning, morning too. too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't listened. To, I haven't done today yet because I haven't passed the Sinai. Randy and I disagree oh, where Sinai is, but that's okay. I don't think Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula. It's only named the Sinai Peninsula because somebody named Mount Horeb Mount Sinai. The problem is it was owned by Egypt at the time of the exodus. So how are they fleeing from Egypt by staying in Egypt? Last time I asked Randy that, he said, well, that's a good question. But didn't have an answer. No, no other questions or comments? Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. 
We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.